Hello, lovelies. Today I have a really fun interview for you. It is with Bernard. I'm not even going to try to say his last name because I can't do a thing. But we are talking about all kinds of crazy things about magic and how magic helped him make a lot of money and about liminal spaces and how we can get in there, about remote viewing and about synesthesia. And it's really, really interesting. And one of the things that really inspired me was how hopeful, how incredibly hopeful this interview was or the stories that he told me anyway. So I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Magical Egypt Live. And today I have with me a young man that I find incredibly intriguing. I met him because of Peter Mark Adams and his mystery or Egyptian mystery course. And we ended up having a great conversation that led to my Celtic history and the power of myth and story. So welcome, Bernard. It's so lovely to have you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I love talking with you and looking forward to this. I am, darling. I'm really looking forward to it, particularly because you are the creator of Magic Schule or Magic School in Germany. So what I would love to know, first of all, is tell me a little bit about that. Oh, in Austria. Sorry, in Austria. Austrian. Yeah. <laughs> That's a bit like um, mixing up Scots and British. <laughs> you don't want to do that. I'm so sorry. I think it's the language. It makes, I'm, yeah. I, I think it's a German word, right? So I get confused. So Austria. So tell me a little bit about Magic Schule. So um, I, I'm a, a teacher at heart. I always uh, strive to convey things that um, I I know I, I have this um, ability to um, teach, to to um, uh, bring enthusiasm about um, things. Uh, and I've always been teaching. Uh, I got self-employed when I uh, was 19 and haven't stopped since. I, I taught screenwriting um, I, and so on. But magic was where it all started. I grew up in a what you could call a magical family tradition, uh, like a cunning tradition. So as far as I can uh, prove it, uh, I'm fourth generation, but I think it goes uh, back further, but it just back, I can't prove it. Um, so I grew up with, um, with magic, with um, discussions about near-death experiences, uh, paranormal things. Um, my, my grandfather, especially, he was my, most important mentor, I think, uh, when we went for walks in the woods, he would show me where the gnomes live. And uh, he had three near-death experiences. He would show me uh, uh, healing herbs and, and and so on. So I, I was steeped in all of this and, and, and stories, of course, my greatest love. So... Over the years, I, um, I met many other teachers, uh, many traditions, and um, I, yeah, I, I tried to do many other things, but I was compelled to, to, to in. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I didn't have a chance <laughs> at some, at some point it was, you have all this experience and knowledge and you can teach. So do this magic school. Magishu it's your and, will, darling. It's your yeah. tellers, yes. So for people that might not understand the word cunning, can you define a little bit what cunning is? <sighs> yeah, it's um, a, a terminology that um, was set up, I think, to uh, as an umbrella term for um, sort of folk healers uh, doing some magical spells, but mostly under the radar of um, official uh, state and church and um, uh, uh, sort of low magic, as it was called earlier. Um, and uh, my, my great grandmother, she was an herbalist and uh, uh, she had a, a grimoire um, that was very, very special. My, my grandfather uh, told me uh, he would have loved to 
uh, have it, um, but he didn't inherit it because uh, when she died, he was uh, in the war. And uh, when he got home, the priest who uh, had all her belongings and it it weren't just uh, it weren't much belongings. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And he said, "No, this old magic book. No, I don't know what you're talking about." It and uh, my grandfather, um, <laughs> you know. It, it was war. He pulled out his uh, his gun and <laughs> set it at the chest of the priest and said, you know, it's war. <laughs> and then the priest confessed that he had burned the book uh, because, of course, it was evil, something like that. And my grandfather didn't regret many things in his life, but that was one thing. And maybe that's uh, one um influence why I hoard books. I yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, it's not surprising. I mean, in, in the work that we're doing with Heka, which is a magical Egypt series on magic, one of the things is there's been a very strong uh, force of suppression of magic, really, for as long as there's been magic, you know, and even in ancient Egypt that we're looking at, the Romans came in and they stole all the papyri from the temples, not the accounting ones, as you might imagine, but the magical mm -hmm. ones, yes. they took them all and they burned them all. So it's not surprising, but it's a huge loss, darling, because like you said, when you said low magic, it doesn't necessarily mean bad. Well, it doesn't mean bad magic. It means more mm -hmm. practical magic, yes. magic that's used every day, right? Yes. Yeah, and with household like items. Healing. Yes. And healing really yeah. is a very big part of that as well. And so I'm sure that was a tremendous loss with all of that indigenous knowledge that your grandmother would have had probably from generations. So, yes. yeah, I, yeah, I think so. And um, there's also another trait that runs uh, through my, it's my, the mother's line of my family. Um, all of them, um, they have this um, sort of magical abilities or, or interests and also a uh, creative uh, talent. So my great grandmother, she was um, an accomplished musician. Um, and my grand, great, uh, my great, great grandmother and grandfather, <laughs> great. Uh, uh, he, he could draw, he could, um, he was making sculptures out of wood. Uh, he was, uh, he had acting talents and um, his daughter, my mother, uh, she can play several instruments. Um, she, she can paint and, and so on. And, and in, in my case, it's a um, bit of acting uh, and storytelling. So uh, these two traits, the, the magic and art, they are running very close together in, in our family. Well, you've mentioned two things that I want to talk to you about today. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of them is your abilities. Mm -hmm. The other one is about story. But before we go there, I'm curious to know what you or how you define magic. What is magic for you, yeah. my love? Yeah. Um, I think it's uh, following uh, a bit the, the terminology of Gordon White. Um, a culture specific way of communicating with our natural um, abilities, with the abilities of our consciousness and the consciousness of um, the world. And I, I'm an animist, so um, there's not much difference to um, maybe propose something new. So I, I don't like this method. It works, of course, like the, to force something to um, bend uh, spirits to your will or, or something like that. That's not my approach. I, I, I like to um, communicate, like um, to say, so I've got an idea. What about that? Could we work together and have a win, win situation? for everyone involved. Uh, that means spirits, plants, fungi, animals, everything. everything. Yes. Yeah. I love Gordon White has been so instructive for me as well. And when I was interviewing people for the series, I got so much of the art and science of, you know, the Alistair yes. Crowley yes. definition, yes. right? Yeah. And I really do prefer Gordon's approach about being in right relationship. Yes 
with the forces of nature. And so it is very much a negotiation mm -hmm. and a win-win kind of situation. So I love that that's how you see it as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was just reading, in fact, about in the, <laughs> the Temple of Cosmos by Jeremy Nadler, um, the idea of punishing and threatening the gods. Mm. And uh, that's not something that I think I'm wanting to take on no. myself. No. That might be a bit more than I can chew, darling. <laughs> All right, so so when you talk about magic in terms of negotiating with this animistic, fully alive universe that you mm. live in, how would you define your abilities within hmm. that relationship? Yeah. Um, so one one ability is I'm a synesthete. Um, I, I I had this since I can remember. So um, the days of the week they have colors and they are. Um, oriented in a certain way in a three-dimensional space. Um, numbers have personalities. And uh, when I, I don't hear music, I see images. And when I taste something, uh, e everything, there, that's, uh, there are images, there are sounds. Um, so I was very surprised that uh, other people don't experience sure. the world in this way. <laughs> Sure, sure. Um, um, so it, it gives you, I would, I would assume it would give you a deeper level of, or more information, right? I mean, when you say that numbers have personality, again, the ancient Egyptians very much felt that, right? And we've taken numbers and turned them just down to a quantity, right? Yes, it's hor and horrible. Horrible. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've like, minimized so many things. Every every life gets pulled out of of this, and of course, it's very it can be overwhelming at times um, dealing with so much information. But um, in in my way, synesthesia um, lends to this notion that the world is alive, that everything communicates with each other. So that was very natural for me. Um, and growing up in this family tradition, um, I, I could only have turned out an animist. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like you see it, right? It's there for you. Yeah. But I'm curious to know, when does it become overwhelming? Under what circumstances? Does it? Is it tied to your emotions? Is it a tied to... Uh, just being in a place where there's too many people or too many things going on? Like, when does the synesthesia become overwhelming for you? Um, when it's too loud, uh, noise okay. is um, uh, when I, I, I really, I hate crowded space and, uh, and too much noise. Um, so dropping acid and going to a live concert would probably be not something. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Dropping acid in a ritual space and yeah. listening to Pink Floyd, then uh, that heaven. Yeah, that's yeah. I uh, I'm I understand the universe. I become one with the universe. <laughs> that's yeah. <laughs> because um, in my, my normal consciousness, synesthesia is a very big factor. But in altered states of consciousness whether it be through psychedelics or through other ritual techniques, my synesthesia is even getting more intense, bigger. My, my, my synesthesias are getting synesthesias. It's like <laughs> a cascading effect. And um, I, I've got this special kind of synesthesia where I... <sighs> I experience things as stories. So I, I think in stories, I, uh, whenever I want, uh, 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 in teaching, for example, there is always a story coming up, uh, not only a parable, but also like metaphors, like, you know, in the Lord of the Rings, when, uh, and I, I cannot not do it. So, um, that's my normal way of thinking. And, because, uh, maybe because of my synesthesia, I experience stories as living entities, as 
I, I approach them like I approach spirits so I can communicate with them. So for me, they are, um, they live uh, in us, they procreate through us and uh, they, they uh, share their information with us. And of course we need them as well as they need us. It's like this MC Escher drawing uh, of the two hands uh, drawing each other. So that's our relationship with stories. And uh, as Terry Pratchett famously said, um, the, the founding uh, um, material of the multiverse is narrativium. So <laughs> we, stories are the, the building blocks of reality. And I can enter in communication with them by reading stories or, or um, by following a TV series or something like that. Because what it does is bringing up so many synesthet synesthetic impressions, expressions, and that lead to um, maybe insights or creative inspiration. Again, so a story uh, uses me to uh, make new stories, for example. Um, and and also it can it can lead to ecstatic states. I had um, some sort of enlightened moments um, just by reading great literature. Yes, like I, I fell in in trance and um, I my my mind went um, totally into uh, enlightened states. So um, that could be what Jeff Kripal means when he talks about book encounters. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, the, the right books were always there for me, the right stories. So that's my normal way of communicating with stories. Um, and in, in altered states of consciousness, I can get in, in touch with stories. I can it's hard to describe. Um, yeah. you know, this is one of the to, things that's very difficult about these inner experiences, right? Is that trying to find words to describe them to other people yeah. Yeah. Is, is difficult, right? It is yeah. difficult. And, and synesthesia is difficult for um, non-synesthetes to follow. And then to imagine it, it there are more, it, it's, so much more intense in altered states of consciousness. Um, and for example, I had one very, very intense ritual where I encountered one of, I think the most important and greatest stories, um, that is there for, for humankind. Um, it was the story of hope. Oh, wow. Um, Can I, you tell us? Yeah. Yeah. I encountered it um, because I'm a Tolkien fan in the form of Erendil, uh, like what was, you know, the um, initial spark for Tolkien to create his mythology. Yes. And, um, uh, so I was aware that I can grasp this story in this form of Erendil because uh, that's my filter. That's, that's my, my love for, for Tolkien's legendarium. Um, but I knew that's just one expression of this particular story. And then I somehow switched and I became the story. And it was like, uh, the subjective camera. I was looking through the eyes of this big galactic story, it just, it just blew me away. Uh, and it, it opened up, uh, like transpersonal experiences. <laughs> I, I, I mean, you know, spirits are very old. And some, some stories, they're very, very old as well. 
uh, some fairy tales. They can be traced back to like 4,000, 6,000 years. And, um, and other stories, they are even older. So um, there's one Australian story about uh, um, this this mountain and fire came out of his head and, and uh, it was a giant and then uh, the giant settled mountain came uh, a fire came out of his head and um, they trace this story back um, to at least thirty six thousand years of age so because. Uh, in in the in the tradition there's um they know this is this mountain and through geological uh, survey they uh it, they knew it it's an old volcano and the last time it erupted was 36000 years ago so this story has been passed down so much so this is a being this is a living entity that's 36,000 years old. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's incredible. And then I, I had this experience with the story of hope. I don't know how old that one is. <laughs> I, wa I was granted the experience of looking through the eyes of this story for a few minutes and it just it just blew me away that's uh the moments where you know why you practice the basics right <laughs> being <Yeah>. grounded <laughs> yeah yeah i have to say that's very interesting because hope is something that i wrestle with i wrestle with hope because sometimes i feel like hope is self gives me an excuse to not take action, right? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I cling to hope desperately <laughs> that it's the only way I'm going to get myself out of things. And so what was the message of hope for you? Mm -hmm. Where did it leave you, darling? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> I think the the most important thing i got out from that is um the story itself so <laughs> and it it seems trite of course but there is hope the, 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 the experience itself was the message um hope is real yeah. hope is alive hope is yes. literally alive I, I didn't experience it as um what you said that we can relax and do nothing. I mean, um, in Tolkien's legendarium, when Erendil um, is being put in the heavens and the morning star rises for the first time, um, hope returns to Middle Earth. That means now they are able to defend Morgoth. So uh, it's not a sign of uh, sitting back and doing nothing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting. Look, I had a conversation with uh, Becca Tarnas. Mm. You know Becca, yeah? Yes, yeah. And, I, um, I, I was at one of her lectures uh, a few months ago online, and I asked her uh, about stories uh, being living entities and, and what other authors beneath uh, or besides Tolkien and Ursula Le Guin might have had this um, experience of really going into the imaginal and, um, what did she say? Um, yeah, she said, um, she uh, thinks of C.S. Lewis. He oh, yes. Also this, um, this vision of, of the fawn, uh, and, uh, J.K. Rowling. Oh, um, and she, she had her first uh, notion of this boy wizard being on a train <laughs> like Carl Jung when he was on a train and had his vision of the wave and discovering the imaginal. Um, uh, and I'm not sure if she had another example. And I brought in H.P. Lovecraft. Yes. Think, of course, the story is <laughs> beautiful, but I think um, you get the sense of there is more to it. He, he discovered it in the yes. imaginal. 
And that's, I think, that's what I wanted to bring up about Becca. When you're saying that it's alive, one of the things that really came alive for me in talking to Becca is the idea of other worlds, other worlds that are actually existent, yes. that they have persistence, that they remain there whether you go and visit or not, and their stories continue along themselves, right? Absolutely. And so that and that we do in fact have access to these realms and can bring back as Jung did, as Tolkien did, you know, incredible inspiration and stories of transformation. And these stories seem to be magical in the respect that they have nutritional value for us, that they do seem to point to archetypal truths, and stories of transformation and good versus evil and battles and triumphs. I mean, they're, they're not small stories. No. These are big no. stories. Yeah. And they can literally change the world. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, there are so many examples um, that a story has uh, incited a war, for example, or. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, uh, also our our holy scriptures and they are stories and they have changed how uh, we see the world how uh, they, they, they even up until this day they uh, they shape our our geopolitics so yes stories are not to be taken lightly well one and of the points that i kind of uh being in magical Egypt and essentially telling a story about ancient Egypt, one of the things that I get confronted with all the time, because I also do customer support, I do, you know, there's only two of us that do magical Egypt. And people are like, this is not the story of ancient Egypt, or that's the story of ancient Egypt. And it's very clear to me that history itself is a story, right? Yes. And there are many stories about history. And as you said, these stories about history, as we know, they're generally told by the victor, but they do very much affect our view of the world and our view of the future, right? Yeah. And so I think story <laughs> is, we. one of the things I think I, I am concerned about possibly, and this is why I want to ask you this question, is I'm not sure how many stories we have for us to grab a hold of in creating a future that we want mm. to share. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, are there any stories that you want to tell, being a magical person who is in right relationship with story itself? Do you have any inclination to write a story? And if you do, what would your story be about? Yeah. Yes, that's that's wonderful. I've I've got um, two answers to that. One is um, um, answer I, I always encourage students to follow, and one is a, a personal one. So. Um, when we talked about the imaginal um, and, and being able to, to enter it, um, there are several methods and I, I got one in the year 2000. Um, I was sitting on a train. <laughs> <laughs> like you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. We're it's, all going to buy train ticket tickets now, darling. I, I, I don't know what. Of course, it's it's a it's a liminal state. And, um, it's yeah, in what, between. What? You're in between. <laughs> yeah. And I was reading a book, of course, and suddenly I had to put my book down, get my notebook out, and I I wrote furiously uh, because I there was such a great inspiration and I knew I had to put it down immediately and uh, this was the um, a way of entering the imaginal uh, and I, I al also teach it in my magic school it's uh, it's gotten into a um, very magical system in its own right I call it mytho magic the magic uh, you do by working with stories and archetypes. Um, and it's a sort of active imagination where you go into your enchanted castle. Uh, and 
I this where the, the information I, I got the, the uh, okay, just visualize this enchanted castle. Are the doors open or not? Then you go in the first room and what you see there. And there are uh, when when I guide people through it, it takes up to 40 minutes. And everything that comes up has meaning, of course. And um, I discovered that not only you can use it as a tool to <laughs> sort of diagnose yourself. Oh, okay. So when this symbol pops up in this room, it can mean this or that. But it is also a magical tool. If you change a room, the part of your life the room symbolizes will change also, will change accordingly. Sometimes instantly. I had this. I had experiences of that. It's incredible. Sometimes it may take a few hours, a few days, or even weeks, but it will change. I'm relying very much on that. Um, and then that's not everything. Uh, as you go out of your enchanted castle, there's of course the surroundings. And um, I, I uh, often exchange my experiences with with my with my pupils, and they say, "Yeah, I've got it right there." And before you said it, it was there. So, like Becker says, uh, it's it's a real place. The imaginal is real. Uh, it's not physical, but. Uh, you get it's it. It's real, and, nonetheless. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, mundus imaginaris. Uh, and uh, this enchanted castle is like uh, an interface to uh, enter it. It's your personal space there. And as you venture out further and further into the surroundings, uh, you encounter the more archetypical realms. And you can meet spirits this way. There are, there are places where you can enter into communication with uh, the elements, with, with the gods even. And uh, of course you have to know what to do. And yeah. how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, don't threaten them. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> yes. And of course, uh, the, the, the rules apply. Be polite. Don't go off the path. And uh, mm -hmm. if you if you eat something, you may have to stay there. So uh, we know this from stories, and this is a way to encounter stories as well. So um, that would be one way to to cultivate our um, ability to um, to be in communication with stories and to get our relationship with stories right. It's very easy to do. I haven't met anyone in over 20 years, 24 years now, who couldn't do it. Darling, um, we might have to get you to do a, like a special session for the Magical Egypt people because it sounds incredible. I would love to. I think, look, I think it'd be wonderful. I personally, my experience with this kind of work has been one that I know is true because I did some inner child work and in my head I mapped out what I was going to do. I was going to go down into my castle. I was going to find my inner child. I was going to hug my inner child and everything was going to be okay. And that was my expectation. So I go into my castle. I go down to the room of my inner child and I push on the door and she barricades me. Mm -hmm. Right now, this was not something that I could imagine or anticipate, or <laughs> I, you know, if my if you'd asked me what I was going to do, it was a big hug and a kiss, and everything was going to be okay. And so, when she barricaded me out, that was not at all something that I expected. And it was an instance where I recognized that this is not my absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. That's a way of knowing that it's not fantasy. Yes. Um, because you're surprised by the things you meet there, yes. by the actions uh, that, that come up. And but that's the perfect word. You're surprised, right? Yes. These things are not, um, and, and, you know, possibly there's some unconscious bubblings up as well, but 
when you are genuinely surprised at what you're finding and the interactions that you have and the information that you get, then you're kind of, you have a visceral experience of yeah. this reality of the other world. Yes, your, your body reacts unwillingly. And um, yes, that's so. And of course, you, you really experience the things there. And as, uh, even if you are not great at imagining uh, the, just the information, it suffices. It's, it's okay. You, you don't have to experience it like the holodeck uh, in, in 3D or something like that. It, um, and yeah, so, and side note, I also had experiences with time magic where I sent information from the future back to my former self uh, and paved the way for very important life decisions in this way. And they have a special flavor, a special feeling uh, with them. And so in, I was not sure, 2020, 21, something like this. Um, there I was again in a ritual setting. And um, I experienced myself sitting on the train, reading the book. It was like looking down on my roughly 20 years younger self. And I knew this is the moment and everything I gathered about my enchanted castle, every experience, everything I knew, I put in like a, a zip file and I gave it to myself 20 something years ago in, in this train. And that's why I got this. I have to write it down. So that was a, a time loop that, that closed in this moment. Wow. You know, chance does that. And I've, I, I've played with it, right? I wouldn't say that it's something that I've, like I have had an a, a, a epiphany like yours, right? But I certainly have heard of people doing that to mm -hmm. great success. Yeah. And it's amazing, right? When you start, like magic, m magic. So in my series, I'm not going to define magic until the very last episode because it's taken me such a long time and I've had to really transform my theory of mind and my cosmology and my, you know, paradigm and all of these things to allow for me to understand it. So I'm trying to take people on that journey. But when you do get to put your hands on it and feel it and play with it, it's a Amazing, right? It's absolutely amazing. It's amazing that you can send yourself messages. Just, I mean, the applications of do not ask that woman out to you know, <laughs> whatever it might be, yeah. right? Yeah. It, it's incredible. I mean, it's incredible it, how you it, can. Absolutely. Uh, I have uh, several examples for that. And they were always very big. In, in one case, I inspired myself to um, apply uh, for who wants to be a millionaire. And um, there was, I, I was standing in, in my bathroom in the morning, um, brushing my teeth. And there was this so, like, like a voice, like, who wants to be a millionaire? That would be a good idea. And uh, OK, well, OK, then I applied and I went on the show and I won big time. No way! Are you serious? Yes. And, oh my God! And like I don't know, like eight or ten years later, I was in a ritual setting and I, not thinking about it at all. And then I saw myself standing in my bathroom, brushing my teeth, and I, I knew this is the moment. And I said to my former self, "Who wants to be a millionaire? That would be a good idea." So, and. I discovered another room in the Enchanted Castle where you can do that. Wow. <laughs> All right, we're signing you up, darling. We're going to we're going to do a session with you. That's amazing. That's amazing. That is amazing. All right, so what other abilities do you have? Go on, tell me what else you can do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mr. The, Magic Shield, what 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 other abilities do you have? Um there is um 
another ability that ties into my second answer to your question. <laughs> um, I'm a trained remote viewer and um, I also teach remote viewing. And for um, 10 years now, together with um, a friend and, and colleague, he's a chaos magician, we had um, uh, a project of um, viewing the future of humanity, the immediate future, the next 10 to 50 years. Um, and it was... Does it look good or bad, darling? <laughs> good news it or depends bad? on us. Okay. It's um, we we uh, we did it with several methods. Not only remote viewing. We also we developed our own uh, divination method, and and uh, we also use several several uh, interdisciplinarity is is very important. And so over the years, we had about easily hundred persons who knew or didn't know about the project uh, for, for some which just said just sit there just relax uh, we'll give you an information field you don't have to understand it uh, just tell us what's going on what what comes to your mind and uh, I would say in easily 80 85 percent people were describing such beautiful um, timelines or a, a timeline it, we, we we couldn't accept it at first we said no 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 that that's uh we, we must have done something wrong uh there's a premise or or um, like that was front loaded uh and uh, for for months we we tried to falsify it to uh how to where could it could have gone wrong but, not to falsify it but to find holes in it possibly. yes to find yes yes sorry that's uh, <laughs> To, to find the holes, we we were like um, law people. Like, uh, where is where could we have gone wrong? Where could uh, where could you interpret it in a way that it would come out? This it 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 can be right. It's it's too beautiful. So, and we we tried it. We tried, and whatever we did, it uh, nearly always came out this way there are several um readings or viewings uh, we had uh, that were inconsistent uh and some that were um where, where the where the, the the people couldn't get into it or something like that yeah. but there was not one that that uh, told us Oh my God, it's going to be bleak and, and so on. But we always got this, it, it, they, um, there were always metaphors, of course. Uh, but we knew the metaphors. Even after years, people who didn't talk with each other, uh, they came up with, Oh, there's the wave again. Okay. We know about that. We, uh, we and, and, we also tried, okay, that's us too. So then we got to my remote viewing teacher and said, uh, could we try it another way? You don't know anything about it. And we did remote viewings, uh, blind, of course. So uh, it came up every time uh, this way that um, if, you, if you can summarize it, there are um, two timelines forking one utopian and one dystopian uh, timeline. Uh, the dystopian being transhumanism, um, control, uh, algorithm, uh, social credit system. We know it. Yeah. And the other one, um, I, I couldn't believe it at first. Uh, I, I was there in, a, in, in surroundings that were nearly too good to be true. Like, the air was just breathing in the air was was um fulfilling you could taste the water out of the rivers it was nourishing it was replenishing it was so good and um and the feeling of yes this is our home it's not uh 
a prison. It is not a school we have to go through or something like that. This planet is our home being, um, being there for each other. It was this feeling of I am because we are and we not only all of humanity, but also animals, plants, wow. minerals, fungi, of course, spirits, everything. Uh, this is, this is home. This is, and not as, um, cognitive notion, not even as a feeling, but sort of instinctual knowing of the body. And that repeated itself over and over. And, uh, we, as, as I said, we, we tried to do it with so many persons, with so many methods and, uh, it came up. It depends on us. It will not uh, come up per se. Um, it's it's our decision. Yeah. So there, there we're back at hope again. Uh, yeah. Yes, hope. <laughs> but so is this what your book is going to be about, darling? If you're going to write a book, <laughs> is it is it about hope? And you know, Christopher Beige. Do you know Christopher Beige? He the. Uh, 72 massive LSD doses. It's uh, something in the mind of the universe. He's a very interesting gentleman. He's somebody that is a, um, a doctor of religious studies yes. and he I, undertook. I, the, believe you know it or him? not, I just finished his book. Oh, wow. Fantastic. <laughs> a few days okay, ago. So <laughs> doesn't yes. it sound like the future that he sees for us? Yes. Yes. It's like this a future human. Absolutely. I instantly recognized it when I read it. That's yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, we, we went public with, with that, um, a few years ago because I was, a, <sighs> that's our findings. I mean, yeah, we, we have to, to put it out there and, um, that's one way of, hmm of having stories that can help us like, yes, there is this story of an utopian timeline. And by telling the story, it gets more attention. You, you did a, a video about the magic of attention and that's because I, I tell it. And I've heard so many times from people when I heard you talk about this, uh, something in me clicked. I, I need, that's, that's it. Thank you for, for telling this story. And, uh, of course we, we heard this story being told from other magicians or practitioners. We didn't have contact with. Interestingly, we had one metaphor that, um, came up from the beginning like the, the years where it is being decided and where we, um, where we have to, um, like know which way we will, we will take personally. Um, this phase is like a psychedelic trip. It's like, uh, and, and you know, this, this trips, they always have a certain, way like first uh, m maybe even before you ingest it you've got this um this wave like the ship uh, has this this wave in front of it uh, you have you you can sense the effects before you ingest the substance and then you ingest it and some time passes then there's always the first one who says do you feel anything already? <laughs> then uh, it, it sometimes passes, and then you say, oh, now I think it's starting. And then, so we, um, we have a, a YouTube channel where we talk about magic and paranormal experiences and so on. And, and we also, um, told about our future project. And so we have it <laughs> time stamped. I, I said, now we are in this phase. Now it's going to be that one. And at the beginning of 2020, I said in, in our video, people strap in, 
Now it's going to lift off. That was just like two or three weeks before everything that happened happened. Uh, <laughs> so we we had this metaphor guiding us along, and the metaphor, of course, is also a story or part of a story. And um, I I think if our viewings are correct. Um, will be through this phase at roughly about 2030. Wow. That doesn't mean everything is going to be all right, but we are through the worst and then something really new can be built. Wow. Um, That's so encouraging, darling. Yeah. It, I mean, it was for me as well because, and you know, I, I grew up in the eighties with lots of dystopian yeah. <laughs> movies and and post-apocalyptic things, and uh, yeah. I couldn't believe it. it but, look, I mean, I, there are moments where I have these weird things. Like I have, I, I just last year. I had this, oh, was it last year? I, I'm terrible with time, but like a future shock, like a future fear feeling, right? I had this anxiety about the future and I didn't know mm -hmm. where it was coming from. I just knew that it was from the future, right? Mm -hmm. And that has now dissipated, which is really, really good. Like I've, I, I've lost the future shock feeling. And this is incredibly encouraging because I think – if people have this story, right, if they have this story, if they are this story, if they're interacting and they're playing and they're dancing with this story and they're imagining what does this mean for me in this story, then all of a sudden we're creating this future. Yes. That's it. I love it. <laughs> and that's why our work is so important to because many people – can see it. Uh, yes. They, they uh, get a context for it. That's yeah. not new agey. That's grounded and uh, gets them really tools to put it into action. Well, that was going to be a question for you. What do you think is the biggest block, blockage for not you, not me, not people who are playing with magic, but for humanity to jump on board and imagine this like what is the biggest impediment like if we're talking about one of the things that i do talk about and i i i'm i should i must stop right but i point fingers at the problem a lot right that the powers that be are hijacking your imagination by telling you gloom, doom, fear, you're going to kill your auntie, right? And so what they're doing is that they're essentially using our processing capability to create what they want instead of this beautiful future that we want, right? And as soon as you realize, oh, it's my choice, I can either unconsciously create what they want or consciously create what we want, then we can move them into this collective dreaming of this beautiful future. Yeah. So how do we get, how do we do that, darling? How do we do that? Yeah. I think one of the most basic problems, especially in the Western world, is this Cartesian divide um, between matter and spirit. I mean, there isn't such a divide. It's just one spectrum. Um, we, we talked about Celtic mythology. There is this um, uh, term of the other world, and I use it a lot, but it's not another world. It's another part of our world. There is no, so, so even Mundus Imaginaris, uh, the imaginal, it's not somewhere else. It's on the same spectrum. We are, we are living in it. And I think if we realize that, not only on an intellectual level, but on a very visceral level, then it becomes self-evident that we co-create this reality and uh, we can decide where we will 
lay our or where we put our focus um fear guilt shame <laughs> joy well, this is going to take me back to i want you to do a thing for us because i feel like entheogens have a very important role for those that are willing to try them because they give people a tangible experience of other world, right? But yeah. there is so many people that do not have access or do not have desire to do that. And so the idea of you taking us into the magic castle and literally giving us a tour of mm -hmm this liminal space and having people be surprised that might encourage people to believe in magic. Yes. Yes, I think so. And they have this tool at their hand whenever they like, uh, they can explore for themselves. So it's, uh, you don't have to wait uh, for the moon to be in the right face. You don't have uh, to use magical implements. And I mean, I love this stuff, but uh, I also love uh, to not uh, have to use them. So it's the magic of the empty hand. Um, and I, I can I can enter my my enchanted castle uh, waiting for the bus, just standing there I, I i learned to do it with open eyes so i can do magic wherever i am whenever and affect changes i think that look i've never been a big ceremonial girl mm -hmm. and i think that these rituals and these ceremonial aspects are really good at helping people to differentiate a space of other, other mm -hmm. than the mundane. But I think like yourself, I can just go there, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't need to do that. And I think that this idea of like closing your eyes and walking into the castle is a really great way to distinguish the other from the mundane for people without having to do the robes and the candles and the swords and all of that. I think it, it performs exactly the same function, if not Absolutely. even more powerfully. Yeah, I, don't I don't know. Bother. I'm not a big ceremonial girl, so I can't yeah, really speak yeah. to that. Yeah, it, it, every every tradition is legitimate, of course, and yes. uh, uh, it will appeal to certain mentalities. Um, and like Lon said, loves I, it. Lon uh, loves his robes and yeah, you know all of his tools wonderful. and yeah. And what is it? Different yeah. horses for different courses, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And of course, in the enchanted castle, there's also a magic temple where you can <laughs> you can always do it put on your robe and everything when... <laughs> i think that would be more appealing to me i think part of it is like doing all the robe and then i'm just in my bedroom right it seems like an anticlimax. so if i got to do it though in a magic castle that would mm -hmm. be an entirely different proposition <laughs> yeah. wow so, I mean, this synesthesia ability, you've got the time thing. If if you were going to, if you could gift, if you could bequest your abilities on people, right, which of these do you think would be the most transformative for people? Like what's going to help us shift this thing, darling, to this beautiful, magical ending that you're seeing? Yeah, I think... It I, I would really love to, to share this heightened synesthesia. Um, uh, if I, if I could, uh, like, you know, so here it is, just whoop, <laughs> you have it. Uh, and, uh, because I feel, I feel lonely in this. I, I know a handful of other synesthetes, but they don't have this narrative synesthesia yeah. they uh, when i talk with them they say yeah of course i know synesthesia and uh this tastes like a japanese painting and so on they, they know this but they 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 don't know the it's just stop for a second it it looks like it tastes like a japanese painting it, it yeah if they taste something 
Uh, at, at the, uh, something like that, or uh... <laughs> no, hold on. So I'm eating sushi and I see a Japanese. Yes. Wow, really? Yeah. Oh my god! See, I can't yeah. even imagine this. My and, my and idea. You hear, and you hear something, uh, and you said, "Oh, that's uh, like a, a Balinese uh, 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 music or, or whatever." And I especially I love olives, and every olive tastes in another way so uh, this olive is like oh i'm on a mountaintop in greece and there's the salty air and um and the other one i taste is like oh that's like a gambling hall in the 80s uh <laughs> and all neon and so on and so on and uh and i i hear the sounds of of the you know the, the flipper and then what i <laughs> uh so that's normal synesthesia and then I've got this narrative synesthesia where I encounter stories or where they, um, where music, uh, tells me stories. And, uh, it's not like, oh, I'm like watching a movie or something like that. It's like I go into the story. I'm participating and I, I'm communicating with the protagonists, with with everything, and I can rewrite it. And I would love to to share these experiences with other people um, because I, I haven't met anyone so far who knows this. And I I, w I would love to to exchange experiences to uh, and and what did you do there what how how was it for you <laughs> you know what young man okay one of the things that really got me uh excited to talk to bernard is that in one of my podcasts i was talking about the throwing of my consciousness and the throwing of my attention into somebody else's body. And up until Bernard, I'd never met anybody that had the ability to do that before. So I was really shocked and intrigued that there was somebody else out there that could do that. So now I'm wondering with that kind of, why can't I throw myself into you when you're experiencing this, utilizing the same technique? Interesting question. Like if I can throw myself into you experiencing other things, as we've established that we can both do, mm. I wonder if it would be possible for me to throw myself into you when you're eating olives. <laughs> Let's try this afterwards. <laughs> yes. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to break. There's a guy in Australia that makes the best olives in the world. I swear to you, he is like an olive genius, right? He's a he's an artist. He's ridiculous, and I have to get those olives, and I have to get to Austria, <laughs> 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 and then we're going to do it. That's amazing. From one end of the world to the other. <laughs> oh my god, it'd be amazing though, because I'd love to see it. The closest I've come is. Um, on entheogens, right? Like the trees come alive, the clouds come alive. Mm. And when I was young, my father was blind, not clinically blind, blind, blind. And so we would sit and we would listen to um, music and he would shamanize me into the music. And so he would mm. tell me the story, perhaps like what you're seeing, right? And so he would be in the music mm -hmm. and he would share the story with me. So I was able to come along on that journey, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And it was amazing, like mm -hmm. particularly classical music, right? And and uh, that was really, really interesting. I haven't tried to do that, but uh, yeah, I, I think one of the things that I think, like if we're talking about a spectrum of meaning in reality, right, that this skill of yours gives you an incredibly rich, interactive, visceral acknowledgement of a living universe, okay? Yes. And I think that the lack of meaning for so many on this planet is the complete absence of anything magical whatsoever, right? Mm. It's a job and a coffee and a 
bed and a wake up call. You know what I mean? There's like no matter. Yes. Just there's no interactivity. There's just a series of events that uh, repeat endlessly. And while my life is a series of events that repeats endlessly as well, because I have to get up every day, I'm still, I have these journeys. Like when you were saying about that moment where you're on the train and you get this thing and you write it down, I had three conversations yesterday that a topic came up and the first time it came up, it's like it, a red light went off in my head and I didn't know why I had no idea, but I'm just like, Oh, okay. That's a red light. And then I'm having the next conversation. And then I ask a question for somebody in your class and the answer is that same topic. And then I look at this problem I've been having in my business and it's the same topic. And all of a sudden it wells up and it's like, this is yeah. what I, you know what I mean? This is yeah. what I need yes. to talk yes. about. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's like, like, like you, um, telling about this, this book, uh, LSD in the mind of the universe. And I have just read it. It's, I have this experiences since I was a child when I, I was reading, uh, since I could read, uh, from ver very early on. And, uh, of course, I would also always come uh, upon words that I didn't know. And I asked my mother or somebody else, what does this word mean? And every time, a few hours, maybe the day after that, the word would come up again in a totally different context. And of course, you could say, oh, yeah, it's the, the focus of your attention. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, pregnant women always seeing other pregnant women. Yeah, maybe, but I knew this, um, uh, this experience. So from, from very early on, uh, I was used to, it's a sort of interacting with, with the world in, in my, um, case, it was nearly always in the form of stories that I read. Amazing, darling. I've enjoyed so much this conversation and I am not seeing this lightly. I really would love to do a, uh, what do you call it? Is it a path working? Is it a meditate guys at visualization? Like what do you yes. actually call this? Sort of, thing? Um, active imagination, active imagination. All right. Yeah. So let's yeah. really organize this for our people. I would love to. And introduce them to the magic castle. Oh, it would be a blessing for us, darling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you're going to have to write a book about it. That's the thing. Yeah. Um, if uh, I would be able to, I, I don't know how, but um, my uh, th there was a, a sort of inspiration a few years back of a book I would like to write where you where you experience not only what the protagonist experiences, but at the same time, what other people experience and, and not like, uh, first you, uh, you read what the protagonist, uh, experiences and then person A, person B, but at the same time, I, I don't know how to do it. Uh, 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 that's not, not possible in our linear literature, but I would love to, to bring this to the world. Yeah. Yeah. Have, have you read my Iboga report? Not yet, darling. No, I have not it, yet read it. Yeah. There, I, I had this experience there, uh, that, that was just one tiny part of the experience, but I, uh, I, I not only remembered my childhood, I relived it in, in, uh, every minute detail. Um, I was my former self my, as a child. And at the same time, I, uh, was the other childs who were with me and I saw through their eyes, I experienced what my words and actions uh, how it affected them at the same time being everyone in the scene and 
I mean, I think that's how the universe is experiencing itself through everyone, <laughs> not only every human, but every living being. And uh, at least uh, being able to convey this experience in, maybe it's not literature, maybe it's in some other form, that would be what, I, uh, what I'd love to give the world. It's so crazy. Here's my superpower. My superpower is being fully asleep and waking up at the moment that I need to wake up to hear somebody saying something on a YouTube video. Do you know what it was this morning? It was that when you die and you go into your past life recollection, what you do is you feel every feeling that you've yes. given cause for every other person, yes. right? Yes. So yes. all the pain, yes. all the pleasure. And yes. it's like, I'm like, oh, that's so important. And here you are talking about it, but real time. <laughs> and, and, and that's what, what, what I... <laughs> What I experienced yeah. in, in this, that was uh, an initiation, if I ever had one. Um, that is the initiation, isn't it? I mean, that, like you said, that is the, that's God's experience. That's what, yeah, that's, I mean, it, you can imagine. I mean, even just Christopher Beige, as he was going through those levels, how overwhelming mm -hmm. it was. So you can imagine, magnify that with how many billions of people there are on the planet at the time and to yes. feel... All Not to of speak that. of other worlds and parallel dimensions <laughs> and and creatures and uh, yeah, it's it's yeah, <laughs> it blows your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Love well, it. <laughs> <laughs> well, darling, you have your work cut out for you. I'm I'm going to think about how that might be done. That's crazy, but I'm not going to give up on those olives. I'm going to bring those <laughs> yes. olives because I want to see this thing. I want to try it. <laughs> myself and we'll... forward to it. <laughs> me too darling and thank you and look i'm going to hold you to this we're going to set up a magic castle uh liminal imaginal realm excursion yes that's we'll it that. that'll <laughs> be amazing thank you so much for your time darling it's been wonderful i've really enjoyed talking to you great pleasure thank oh, you for tell people me. where they can find you oh yes uh that's uh so far only in german i'm afraid uh it's uh, magieschule.at um, and uh, some time in the future, I hope there will also be a, an English version, but that will take a consider considerable amount of time. But uh, so far, um, magieschule.at and I'm on Facebook. Fantastic. Um, you say it much, but I said magic shuli. <laughs> so you say it so much. Magic shuli. <laughs> magic shuli. I literally said, I literally had my very first Thai yes. conversation. <laughs> it was yeah, you posted it. <laughs> yeah. I answered a question and they understood me. I mean, that's mm. just amazing. So Austrian or German, whatever. In Austria, you speak German. Am I crazy or yes. do you speak Austrian? And okay, so I'm not it's, that crazy. It's, it's German, but it's um, very different from Germany German. Um, okay. They, uh, it's a bit like American English and British English. Okay, fair enough. So, but it's still it's German. German. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, darling. I've enjoyed it. And uh, we will we'll see more of you soon. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much.